keep the Bible open in front of you, we're going to be working through uh, this amazing passage, but maybe a slightly mysterious, opaque passage from Isaiah chapter 7. Let me pray for us as we uh, do that together. Father, thank you for this great season of Advent as we enjoy preparing ourselves to celebrate Christmas, as we see signs of Christmas festivities like Charlie's jumper appearing before our very eyes. Uh, And Father, today as we uh, look at this great prophecy from the book of Isaiah, may we see signs of your appearing coming before us as he looks into the future and prophesies about Jesus. So come by your Holy Spirit, we pray, and speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, They are these. Are you a person who finds it easy to trust people? Do you find it easy to trust? Are you somebody who believes promises that have been made to you? Are you somebody who thinks the best of others? that trusts someone's loyalty and their commitment? Are you somebody who finds it easy to trust God? The Bible calls that faith. Or, alternatively, are you a person who who finds it difficult to trust? You expect the promises of others to be broken. You expect others to let you down, to disappoint you. You're just waiting for someone to double-cross you or betray you. And so you look after yourself, you're very self-sufficient. You think to yourself, hey, it's happened to me before, time and again, why should the future be any different? The Bible calls that fear. And this Advent we've been uh, working our way, or looking at different parts of the book of Isaiah, this great Old Testament prophet, and we've been exploring faith. Last week we looked at the difference between fantasy on the one hand, where things you just have this crazy belief that will never come true, and true faith on the other. This week we're looking at fear or faith. How do we live? Do we live in the light of fear, or do we live in the light of faith? And faith you can define as kind of absolute confidence in God. Absolute confidence that God is real, that God knows your name, and that he's always there for you. And can you imagine for a moment, if you had that absolute confidence, whether you're here this morning, you're a skeptic, you're not sure you believe, or you're trying to believe, or you have faith the size of a mustard seed, what would it be like if you genuinely had that absolute confidence that God is real, that he knows your name, and that he's always there for you? It would make an incredible difference, wouldn't it? In the temptations you face and wrestle with, in the difficulties that life throws up, and the opportunities that life offers you. And in today's passage, Ahaz, the king of Judah, is presented with this stark choice. Choose faith or choose fear. And we're going to begin by looking at, uh, we're going to look at three things, the promise, the offer, and the sign. And we're going to start with verses 1 to 9, so a little bit earlier than our reading, the promise. Because I need to set this passage in its wider context, the big picture, if you like, of chapters 1 to 12, the uh, opening section of the book of Isaiah. And what has happened is Israel has been divided into two, between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah, its capital is Jerusalem. Uh, Israel, it's the northern kingdom, the capital is Samaria. They have turned away from God. But Judah is in the process of turning away from God too. And so Isaiah, in the first four chapters, kind of condemns the injustice that he sees, the exploitation of uh, the weak and the vulnerable, the fragmentation of family life and of community. He uh, condemns the idolatry of the people as they continue to go to church. They do worship at the temple, but they live in, in the light of other gods. They're hypocrites, he says. And then he condemns their immorality, their sexual promiscuity. And he begins to say, judgment is coming, it is approaching. And so we see in chapters 5 and 6, the hearts of the people of God slowly being hardened. And in the midst of that, Isaiah is given this task to speak God's word, knowing that no one will listen to what he has to say. 
and it isn't because there are children running around everywhere while he's speaking. <laughs> and yet, in the midst of this prophecy of judgment, you have these signs of hope in chapters 7 to 11. It speaks of the coming Messiah, the King of Israel. When everything looks like it's fallen apart, that hope remains. And the promise of a remnant, a small group of faithful people surviving, is there throughout. And so you get this picture in chapter 7 of the virgin and child. You get the promise of the wonderful counselor, uh, the prince of peace. The government will be upon his shoulders in chapter 9. And you get this picture of the stump of Jesse with a, a new shoot growing up through the stump in chapter 11. And that leaves Isaiah incredibly in the face of this entire kind of prophecy of judgment at the end in chapter 12 to sing praise to God, to be joyful and not depressed. In our immediate context in chapter 7, Judah and its king Ahaz is faced with a problem. Israel, the northern neighbour, used to be part of the people of God, has teamed up with a pagan neighbour, Aram, and they've joined forces against Judah. And you can see in verse 1, Ahaz and the people have just discovered that is what is going on and they're terrified. Verse 2 describes that, says that they've been shaken like trees in the wind. They know the stakes are high. The future of the nation is at stake. The future of the covenant, the future of salvation itself. How will Ahaz respond? What will he do? Will he fear or will he have faith? And the Lord gives Isaiah this message for Ahaz. What does he say? Don't be afraid, he says. Keep calm, don't lose heart, don't let fear dictate your decisions. See things, he says, as they really are. These two nations, Israel and Aram, they are just like smoldering lumps of firewood, stubs. They, don't, they haven't got much power, they're on the way out. But your fear magnifies their power. And he says, what you fear will not happen. Because the only power they have comes from themselves, but the power that Ahaz has comes from God himself. And so the prophet promises in verse 8 that eventually they will be destroyed, so all Ahaz has to do is trust God for his deliverance. Stand firm in your faith, says Isaiah. That's it. But even in very practical matters, so in your strategy, in your strategic decision making, in your tactical evaluations, in your diplomacy, in your politics, be faithful, not fearful. And God here demands of Ahaz, as he demands of you and me, not a private faith, but a public faith. And he says, if you don't have faith, then you will fall. That's all you need, but it is a matter of life and death. So how is Ahaz going to respond to the promise? Is he going to respond with fear or with faith? God moves from promise to offer. That's when we get to chapter 10, the first verse in our reading. So God has made this promise and then he offers Ahaz a guarantee. And you notice here how God speaks himself at this point. Not the prophet. God himself knows the stakes are really high and he intervenes directly. And what does he say? He says, ask me for a sign. Go on. Do you want me to prove it to you? I will. Do you want me to give evidence for my promise? Then I'll do that. Do you want a visible gesture? Okay, that's absolutely reasonable. I will stop at nothing, he says. You can ask whatever you want. The deepest depths or the highest height. He is in effect saying to Ahaz, I will move heaven and earth for you. It's an incredible offer. How does Ahaz respond? He refuses to ask God for that proof, that guarantee. And he says, I'm not going to put God to the test. Now, on the surface, that seems like the right decision, doesn't it? It sounds like Jesus in the wilderness when Satan says to him, put the Lord your God to the test. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. It's 
seems here to be saying, I'm going to reject this idea that I'll only trust God, I'll only have faith if I see a sign or proof. And so he seems to be refusing to treat God like a performing animal and using his own faith as a kind of sugar lump, rewarding God for this trick that he's just performed for him. He's saying, in effect, it seems, I don't need a sign, I already trust God. He doesn't need to prove himself to me. But is that really what's going on here? I don't think it is. Because the prophet condemns him for his response. And you know, the reality is there is a wrong way to refuse a sign from God. He says, in effect, I don't want God to prove himself to me because I don't want to believe. I don't want to have to change. And so Ahaz here looks pious, he looks righteous, he looks holy, but actually it's evasion. The proof, you see, if God proves himself, then Ahaz will have to act on God's claim to his life. So Ahaz refuses to submit or subject his rule to the claim of faith. And so he chooses to base his decisions on fear and not faith. And instead of trusting God, he plays politics. And he appeals to the king of Assyria for help. And if you want to look into it in a bit more detail, you can read 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 1 to 9. We're not going to do that this morning. But there, Ahaz, the king of Judah, writes to the king of Assyria and says, I am your servant, I am your vassal. Please come and rescue me from this threat. And here is some treasure for my temple to demonstrate my loyalty to you. That is what the people of Israel had asked of God when they were in Egypt. That is the relationship that the people of Israel had with their God. He was the one they served. He was the one who had rescued them. He was the one that they had given their treasures to in the temple. And Ahaz gives all that away to the king of Assyria. And he shifts his allegiance from God to the empire. That was a perennial problem for Israel. They trust in chariots and horses, in real politic, and things that they think will genuinely make a difference, not in God, who they, they fear will not be able to help them. So my question to you is, who are your, or what are your chariots and horses? The things, the practical things that you trust in instead of God. What are your chariots and and horses. So there's been a promise, there's been an offer, and finally there is a sign, verses 14 to 17. Even though Ahaz has said, I don't want one, God offers it anyway. He offers and announces a sign. But now it is a sign both of deliverance but also of judgment. Ahaz has said, I want to do it my way. I want autonomy from God. And God gives him that freedom. He's now under the protection of Assyria, not God. So you have this judgment that comes in this sign. But at the same time, you have hope and promise mixed up within it. And so we're just going to spend a moment looking at it. And what I want you to remember is the way prophecy works. Prophecy works as a kind of spiral. So just picture a spiral in your mind. You might get to an end point, so when you read these things about the virgin being with child called Emmanuel, you'll immediately think Jesus. But when Isaiah originally spoke about it, he meant something slightly different in his own context. So let's not rush to the end too quickly before we look at what was going on at the beginning. So God here, first of all, reaffirms his commitment to his people despite Ahaz's fearfulness. A virgin will give birth to a son called Emmanuel. That's a young woman of marriageable age, a maiden, a virgin. She was possibly known to Ahaz, maybe already in his court. And Isaiah points to her and says, look, God is with us. That child will be called Emmanuel. It's a concrete sign that God remains the guardian, the protector, the defender of Israel, that whatever happens, they have no need for fear. 
and the child, the birth of that child, conjures up, summons, calls forth faith from the people of God. And he goes on to say that this immediate threat of Aram and Israel will be overcome very soon. This strange thing about knowing the evil and the good. That was a child growing up. Some commentators say that was therefore a period of about two years. Uh, others say, well, maybe that was when he becomes, uh, he, he becomes an adult, so he can enter his majority as the king. So maybe a few more years than that. But what he is effectively saying is, Ahaz, you need not have worried. It will all be over soon. So there's comfort. But then there's judgment. A new and greater threat will come. Verse 17, the king of Assyria. The very person that Ahaz has put his faith in, the one he has pledged himself to, he is the one who will consume Judah. And the fate of Judah will be worse than anything they've experienced since the division of the kingdom of God. And so it ends with that judgment, but still in the midst of that, you have this sense, this whisper of hope. Because the child, Emmanuel, remains. And he'll be eating curds and honey. Though Assyria will decimate Judah like a swarm, Isaiah goes on. Though thorn bushes and briars will replace vineyards. Even though the men will lose their beards. It's a bad thing. Still, there will be a remnant left eating curds and honey. Hello. And one day, even Assyria will be overcome. That is the hope that Isaiah leaves, the hope of the Messiah, the coming king, that weaves its way through judgment and condemnation, that pops up when he speaks of this virgin and child. In, verse, in chapter 9, with the wonderful counselor. In chapter 11, with the stump of Jesse. And that is why, the hope of the Messiah is why, Isaiah doesn't lament, but praises God. And ultimately, that hope was fulfilled hundreds of years later. After years of oppression, Assyria came and went, Babylon came and went, Persia came and went, Greece, Rome, they all ruled over the people of God. And yet, one day, a child was born of a virgin. A new king, the Messiah, the Word made flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. That's why we've got here, inscribed on the crib, God was here. He really came. This promise was fulfilled. Jesus, he was the one who redefines Israel around himself, a people, not a land. He's the one that redefines the problem, not as an external threat, not the nations, but the heart, sin and Satan, not the Romans. Isaiah saw Jesus and it gave him faith. It gave him faith. So just to wrap things up, Isaiah thrusts a child right into the middle of all our lives. Just as we are experiencing right now, which is fantastic. It's not our private lives, it's not our personal beliefs, it's not our personal morality. It's our public life. It's our history. And he calls us to a, a, um, a life of faith, not fear. One of my favorite commentators says this of Isaiah. The awesomeness of Isaiah is that it asserts the issue of faith or fear as a great public policy issue. Faith matters to life and death, to war and peace, to prosperity and destruction, to concrete decisions in the real world. How does your faith impact your public life? How does it shape your public life? I'm just going to give you one personal example uh, from church life. As all of you know, we've had financial challenges this year at St. Paul's. That hasn't been easy, and we as a team at St. Paul's have been working hard to try and sort that out. So you've heard us asking you to give. But we've also been finding ways to try and reduce our spending to make ends meet. 
And over the summer, it all came to a head. Rick and Louis were on sabbatical. We were days away from running out of money altogether and not being able to pay our staff. And I was afraid. I was full of fear. And we kept cutting, we felt desperate, we were looking at ways in which we could save money as best we could. And you know, we at one point cut too fast and too far. And it impacted lives of people in this church. And at that point, God pulled me up and said, Rod, what is going to shape your life and inform your decision making here and now at this moment? Is it fear or is it faith. By the grace of God, we realized our mistake and we reversed some of those cuts and we decided no more. We had gone far enough. If we went any further, we would cease to be ourselves. And we turned things around. And the amazing thing is God was faithful to that. And so we've reduced expenditure this year by nearly £100,000 without those cuts. We have a balanced budget for 2014. God is faithful. It was a public decision that was changed because God called me to move from fear to faith. And so I wonder what that might look like for you. And perhaps you're sitting there thinking, okay, that's good, but I need to grow my faith because my faith, like you, Rod, is small. Well, I found it really useful to think about five faith catalysts that I'm going to mention here briefly that might help you grow your faith this Christmas time. They come from a guy called Andy Stanley, who runs a church in the US called North Point Community Church. He's a great man to listen to. These are the five faith catalysts. They all begin with P, so you might be able to remember them. Practical teaching. Ask yourself, is there a command to obey? Practical teaching. Providential relationships. Is there an example to follow? That might be in the text, but it might be somebody you know that inspires you. Private disciplines. Are you regularly praying? Are you regularly giving? That will give you faith. Personal ministry. Are you serving somewhere and stepping out and doing something that makes you feel uncomfortable? That will stretch your faith and see it grow. And the fifth P, pivotal circumstances. Things go wrong in your life, things go well in your life. Something decisive happens, something pivotal. You can't control it, but it can be an opportunity to grow your faith. So five faith catalysts. And what I'd love us to do is just do what we did a few minutes ago and just turn to one another. That can be in families or a little bit further. And uh, I want to ask you to think of two things. I want you to think about, in all that's been said, is there a command for you to follow? Do you feel God is saying something? This is what I want you to do. And I want you to think about that in concrete, real terms. This week, what could you do to grow your faith in terms of looking for a command to obey, something practical. And then I want you to think, is there an example here to follow? It might be in the passage Ahaz or Isaiah. It might be in your own life. And then I just want you to, th just last question to ask yourselves is, and who are you going to tell about what God has been doing for you? Okay, can we do that? So if you want to, I'm just going to pray for us, but find your family or uh, somebody near you, 